Welcome to the Wipeout 2048 Beginners Tutorial. Wipeout 2048 is the latest iteration in the Wipeout series, starting life on the PlayStation Vita before making its way to the PS4 as part of Wipeout Omega Collection. The aim of this video is to provide an insight into the mechanics of the game for those who may be coming in for the first time, and to explain some of the more advanced techniques for more experienced pilots. While this video has been created with the Omega Collection in mind, most of what you'll see is also applicable to the original Vita version. I'll point out any differences along the way. If you're looking for a similar tutorial video for Wipeout HD Fury, have a look at the one I did for the original PS3 game, the mechanics are identical to the Omega Collection. The first step to any racing game is learning how to handle your craft. Wipeout is very different to a lot of other racing games out there in that you're effectively flying rather than driving, and trying to handle your craft like a car will cause you to run into problems very quickly. What I'll describe in this section are the default controls for your craft. If you find you prefer a different arrangement, they can be remapped from the options menu. But be aware that if you're playing the original game on the Vita, you will only be able to select from a number of presets. To steer your craft, use left and right on the D-pad or the left analog stick. The main thruster is controlled by the X button. Hold it down to accelerate and let go to allow the craft to slow to a halt. The first big difference between Wipeout and standard racing games is that you have two sets of brakes, one on the left, one on the right. They are fully analogue and are operated using the L2 and R2 triggers. The air brakes can be used as you would expect them to be in a normal racing game by holding both down at once, which will rapidly slow you down. However, remember what I said about thinking of your craft as flying. The real function of the air brakes is to help you turn more sharply. Have a look at what happens to the trajectory of the craft when each air brake is applied individually. By raising one of the air brakes, you'll increase the air resistance on that side of the craft, causing it to veer over. If you combine this with regular steering, you'll find that the air brakes will allow you to turn far more sharply than without. I'll go into more detail with how to use them effectively later on. You can also use the L2 and R2 triggers to activate lateral thrusters on the craft to push it over to one side. This is called side shifting. Double tap either the L2 or R2 triggers to make the craft side shift in that direction. Again, I'll go through scenarios where this will be useful later on. As you are effectively flying, you'll also need to consider how to manage the pitch of your craft. You can use this to smooth out a landing, or to try and raise the craft off the track for reasons I'll bring up later. To pitch the nose of the craft, use up on the D-pad or left analog stick to push the nose down, and use down to pull the nose up. If you wish, you can also use motion controls to manage the pitch. While certainly not advisable when racing in high speed classes, you can use R1 to take a look behind you. If you'd like a different point of view while you race, you can change it using the triangle button. There are three viewpoints you can use. By default, the craft will be set to near chase mode, which is what you see here. Pressing the triangle button once will switch you to far chase mode. Pressing it again will set you to nose view and one more time returns you to far chase. This is all a matter of preference, use whichever one feels the most comfortable to you. Your craft can carry a range of weapons during a race. To activate a weapon you've picked up, use the square button. I'll say more on the different weapon systems later. Alternatively, you can use the circle button to absorb the weapon. This restores a portion of your shield energy. Different weapons will restore different amounts of energy. The options menu will allow you to remap any of the controls and adjust the sensitivity of any analogue features such as the air brakes and motion sensor. 
Do be aware that in Omega Collection, the control scheme is shared between HD Fury and 2048. There is also one final function here on the L1 button. This is mode specific. In HD Fury Speed Laps, you can use it to invalidate your lap time and gain a turbo. In Detonator Events, it will fire your EMP. And in Eliminator and Combat Events, you can use it to combat spin. There are five teams to choose from in Wipeout 2048, all of whom have their own strengths and weaknesses which cater for different playstyles. Unlike previous games, however, each team now has four different variants, providing a total of 20 different craft. Initially, the only craft available to you is the Fizar Speed variant. Others become available as you gain more experience and complete challenges in the campaign. I'll explain more about that later on. Fizar are the popular choice for beginners. While traditionally they tend to have lower speed stats in favour of excellent handling, this time they take on the role of being the most balanced of all the teams. They are perfect for the pilot who wishes to cover all bases. AG systems are pure racing craft. They're incredibly agile and as such are ideal for pilots who wish to excel on technical circuits. However, this is offset by them having comparatively weak combat systems, so their firepower and health statistics are very poor. Kyrex are the bruisers of the AGRC, designed to dish out as much punishment as they can. They are fast, tough craft, outfitted with very powerful weapon systems capable of severely damaging any lighter craft in their way. As a result though, their handling can be quite heavy, requiring good air brake use to control them. Oricom are competent racers, but they're geared more towards survivability than the other teams. Their speed is formidable, and while their weapons are not quite up to Kyrex standards, they are able to withstand far more punishment than any other team. However, this comes at the expense of weight, making them tricky to handle. Piranha prioritise speed and aggression above all else. They are by far the fastest craft available, and they couple this with weapon systems on par with Oricon. But this mix makes them a real glass cannon, as they are generally fragile, and the less said about their handling, the better. They are perfect for expert pilots and those who like to take risks. As well as the general characteristics of the teams, there are four different variants of craft for you to choose. Each one excels in different areas, but they can be used in any game mode. Speed class craft are the fastest variants. They have the highest speed stat and are also fairly straightforward to handle. However, they are not suited to combat, having the lowest health and firepower stats. They also cannot use the Quake weapon and only fire one rocket at a time. Fighter class craft are geared towards combat and have the highest health and firepower stats to illustrate this. They're obviously the ideal craft to use in combat events, but the more aggressive player may find them useful in races too. However, the weight of these craft make them slow and their handling extremely sluggish. They're equipped with bombs instead of mines and can fire three rockets simultaneously. Agility class craft are the easiest to handle and are well suited to technical circuits. They have very powerful air brakes, allowing them to navigate tight corners without slowing. They have reasonable firepower too, making them more formidable in combat than speed variants. But this makes them generally slower than all other types. They can use all weapons except the bomb and can fire two rockets at a time. Each team also has a prototype craft, and they're all unique in their own right. Fizar's prototype is a speed class craft that starts off each lap slower than everybody else. Hitting speed pads will steadily increase its speed meter, eventually making it the fastest craft on the track once maxed out. The speed meter is reset every lap, and crashes and weapon impacts will also reduce the meter. The AG Systems prototype is an agility class craft. It has an extremely high handling rating, it can side shift further than any other craft, and it can perform a double barrel roll, receiving a much larger boost if done successfully. It can also combat spin in any game mode, but cannot fire quakes backwards in normal races. The major downside is that shielding is paper thin. The double barrel roll also takes longer to perform, meaning you may not be able to pull them off as regularly as a normal barrel roll. The Kyrex prototype is a fighter variant that is armed with one of the most deadly weapons available, a minigun that is capable of tearing apart other craft with ease if placed under sustained fire. 
it reloads by itself, negating the need for weapon pads. But this does mean it cannot use any other weapons, and the reloading rate is fairly slow. You will also need to rely on absorbing ammo from the minigun to restore shield energy. Oricom's prototype looks like the precursor to the dual hold craft that would become popular in later seasons. It's a fighter class craft that plays on the heavy shielding that Oricom is known for. This variant is not slowed at all by any kind of impact from weapons or other craft, although it will still take damage. However, it cannot pick up any defensive weapons and its size makes it extremely sluggish. It also cannot restore shield energy by absorbing weapons, but it will slowly regenerate over time. The Piranha prototype is the strangest of all. As a speed class variant, it has an incredibly high top speed and will accelerate on its own, requiring no input from the pilot. But this comes at a massive price. You cannot steer the craft. The only way to control it is by using air brakes and side shifting, which requires absolute mastery of both techniques. This is one for experts only. So after introducing you all to the different variants of craft that you can choose, there may be some of you asking yourselves, well, what does all that actually mean on the track? The performance of each craft is broadly broken down into four stats, speed, handling, firepower, and health. Each individual craft will have a mix of performance in each stat according to the team characteristics and the class that you've chosen. I should point out here that the comparisons you're about to see do not include any of the prototypes, as they have unique features that go beyond just basic stats. The speed stat gives an indication of the top speed of the craft. Speed class craft will have the best performance here, but let's explore how much of a difference this actually makes. We're going to compare two craft at opposite ends of the spectrum. The Piranha Speed has clearly the highest speed stat of the non-prototype variants. In contrast, the AG System's agility is one of the slowest craft in the game in a straight line. Here we will see a comparison of both craft navigating a relatively straight section of Empire Climb at full speed. Both craft will follow approximately the same racing line and will not use any speed pads. Unsurprisingly, the Piranha Speed is the clear winner. On open circuits like Empire Climb, it's clearly advantageous to favour a speed variant. Other classes will likely be relying on their stronger and more varied weapons just to have a chance of keeping up. The handling stat gives us an idea of how easily the craft will be able to turn. Any craft with a high stat here will be ideal on tricky circuits where there isn't a lot of room to get up to full speed. While it may have lost out in the speed stakes, the AG System's agility is the easiest craft to handle. At the other end of the scale, with by far the lowest handling stat of all, is the Piranha Fighter. This will be a simple test of how quickly each craft is able to perform a full 360 degree turn. There's absolutely no contest here. The AG Systems is able to go through two turns in the time it takes the Piranha to do just one. If you want to get a craft with a low handling stat through a technical circuit, you're really going to need to know how to manage your air brakes. The firepower stat gives us an idea of how powerful the onboard weapon systems are for each craft. The higher the stat, the more damage the weapon will do before mitigation. These type of craft excel in combat events, but can quickly finish off any speed variants found in races too. The Kyrex Fighter has the highest stat in the game and is a fearsome opponent. Representing the other end of the scale is the Fizar Speed, with the joint lowest performance in this stat. In this demonstration, both craft will fire a missile at a stationary Oricon speed craft. The difference in the firepower stats should be reflected in the amount of damage inflicted. First up is the Kyrex. which inflicted 10% damage. Now let's see what the Fizar can do. The Fizar could only inflict 8% of damage. With the same weapon loadout, it would take more time for the Fizar to eliminate an opponent than the Kyrex. 
With that in mind, this would mean that low firepower craft should focus more on taking pot shots than going for all out attack in races, and should definitely not be considered for combat events. The health stat gives an indication of how well the craft can withstand impacts from weapons and collisions. The higher the stat, the better the damage mitigation and the more punishment the craft can take before it's destroyed. Again, this stat is rather important if you want to stay alive longer in combat events, but it can also help in races if you expect a lot of weapons to be flying around. The toughest craft of them all is the Oricom Fighter. And we'll be comparing it to the most fragile, the AG Systems Speed. This test will be similar to the previous one, but this time the two test craft will be receiving the missile impact from a Fizar fighter. Once again, we'll be looking at the difference in the damage received. First up is the Oricon. Which took 8% damage. Then we have the AG Systems. Which ends up taking 10% damage. Survivability is particularly important in combat events, and you may want to consider a high health craft in races if you want to spend less time absorbing weapons just to keep yourself in one piece. If you want to compete in the higher speed classes or navigate technical circuits well, you're going to need to learn how to effectively use your air brakes. Back in the control section, I explain that each set of air brakes can be used to allow you to turn more sharply while your craft is in motion. Let's use the Piranha Fighter to illustrate the effect that they can have. I'm going to turn the craft into the wall at a particular point on this straight. On the left, I will not use the air brakes at all. On the right, I will also hold down the right air brake as I turn. The craft on the right hit the wall much further back than the one on the left, so the air brakes have a significant effect on the turning circle of the craft. As it relies on air resistance, the faster the craft is going, the greater the effect of the brake will be. So how do they work in a racing environment? The easiest way to show the importance of air brakes is to show two craft attempting to navigate a technical section. Let's compare two craft with significantly different handling characteristics. In this case, the Fizar Agility and the Piranha Speed. I'll start off by taking each craft around this technical section of Ultima without any air brake use. First up, the Fizar. With such a high handling stat, the Fizar could handle the course without any use of air brakes at all. However, let's see what happens if the Piranha attempts the same thing. As the Piranha is unable to turn as quickly as the Fizar, it will either need to slow down to navigate this section, or it will end up hitting the walls. Neither is really a feasible option, so we need to use the air brakes to help the craft through each section. Let's see the same section again, but this time using the air brakes along the way. As you enter the first corner here, you can see that the turning circle is too wide and you're going to hit the outside wall. If you give a light tap on the right air brake as you go through, the turning circle is suddenly reduced and the craft can navigate the corner properly. More often than not, holding the brake for a split second will be all you need. Only in the sharpest of corners and the occasional hairpin will you need to hold the brake down for longer periods of time. If we do the same for the remaining corners, the craft should easily be able to navigate this section with no collisions. Here's an example where you may want to hold the brake down for longer. After a small jump on Rockway Stadium, you're presented with a rather sharp hairpin. Just tapping the brakes here will probably result in you needing to let off of the thruster to slow you down. But if you time it just right, you can slam on the right air brake as you turn and drift your craft through the corner.
You'll need these techniques on higher speed classes, as even the most agile of craft will not be able to turn quickly enough to navigate without them. Finding your way around a new track is one thing, especially if it's a technical circuit, but eventually you're going to want to improve your lap times. This is where the idea of a racing line comes into play. What this represents is the line you need to try to follow in order to navigate the circuit in the most efficient way possible, keeping your speed up and ensuring you follow the shortest path across the whole lap. One mistake I see a lot of new players making is trying too hard to stay away from the walls. Let's see what that kind of racing line looks like. While what you saw resulted in no collisions, it was not a good way of navigating this section. Let's try this again, but this time considering how we could improve our racing line. The first thing to consider is that the quickest way to get from one point to another is in a dead straight line. While this is obviously not possible on the track, you need to be thinking about how to keep your path as straight as possible. Any unnecessary sharp turns will slow you down. So to keep your turns as shallow as you can and to ensure you maintain your speed, you should be setting yourself up to enter corners from the outside, before swinging over to the apex, and then exiting as straight as possible on the outside again. Have a look at this first corner to see how this works. I actually got a bit too close to the apex and clipped it here, but you should see that the path I've taken is much straighter than in the other run so I've cleared the corner while covering a shorter distance. Let's see the effect this has if I continue to do the same thing over the whole run. And now let's compare the two runs together. You can see here that despite clipping the wall twice, it was not anywhere near enough to discount the advantage that a good racing line gives you over a poor one. Perfect laps do not necessarily make fast laps. Some tracks encourage the use of a good racing line by placing speed pads in strategic locations. Have a look at the opening section of downtown. While it's a fairly wide track, there are rows of speed pads in just the right places that you can gain an even bigger advantage with the right racing line. Side shifting is quite a tricky technique to get to grips with, but it can be one of the most useful tools you have to improve your lap times. And once you get used to using it, you'll find yourself doing it without even thinking about it. The first thing most people learn how to do with side shift is to pull them away from a wall when they've undercooked a sharp corner. Here's a good example of how this works on the sharp hairpin of Rockway Stadium skill cut. You can see here that even with heavy air braking going through, I'm still going to collide with the outside wall. However, if I side shift over to the left, I end up moving away and I avoid the collision. Side shifting can also be used to correct your racing line, as sometimes exiting one corner doesn't set you up very well for the next one. Have a look at this corner series we used earlier from Ultima. There are two speed pads after this first corner. If we line ourselves up to hit them both, we end up on the wrong side of the track to tackle the next left-hander. However, as we hit the pad, if we side shift over to the right, we pull ourselves away from the left wall, opening the corner up. Without side shifting, we would have had to use some heavy air braking to get the craft back under control and would have ended up losing time. It's worth remembering that unlike turning or using the air brakes, side shifting has no effect on your forward speed. 
If you can correct your racing line with side shifting rather than air braking, always go for the side shift. Barrel rolls are a quick and easy way of gaining a speed boost during a race, and it's a technique you're going to need to use very often if you want to have any chance against the higher difficulty AI or pilots online. Anytime your craft leaves the track, you have an opportunity to perform a barrel roll. If done successfully, you'll gain a speed boost on landing. Every attempt will cost you 15% of your shield energy, regardless of whether you land it successfully or not. If your shield energy drops to 15% or below, you will not be able to barrel roll. To pull off a barrel roll, while your craft is airborne, hit left right left or right left right on the D-pad or left analog stick. Make sure you've left yourself enough room for the animation to finish before you land, otherwise you won't get the boost and you'll still lose the shield energy. This is doubly important if you're piloting the AG Systems prototype. It should be noted that in time trial and speed lap mode, you have infinite shield energy and you can barrel roll without any restrictions. Managing the pitch of your craft is particularly important to allow you to access different routes on some courses and also to ensure you spend as little time in the air when it's not needed. Pitching up will allow you to gain more height when you go over a peak in the track. This may allow you to perform barrel rolls you may not have been able to before, or if you're just getting used to doing them, to give you a little more time to pull them off. Here's a few examples of where this can be done on Subway. The peak you see in front of you will not give enough height to perform a barrel roll. However, if you raise the nose as you approach it, you have to be very quick as you won't get a lot of time, but it's definitely worth trying. Here's a couple more examples from the same track. Raise the nose on the approach and you'll get just enough time to try a barrel roll. This is actually much easier to do on higher speed classes. Raising the nose will also give you extra height if you use a turbo over a peak. Doing this on Ultima will allow you to access different routes. However, spending a lot of time in the air will significantly slow you down. Ideally, you only want to be in the air for as long as you'll need to be. This is where pitching the nose down comes into play. This very sharp peak on downtown can throw you into the air very easily. However, if you pitch down as you go over the top, you'll still have enough room to barrel roll and you'll return to the track much more quickly. Managing your pitch becomes very important on high speed classes as it becomes much easier for your craft to be thrown into the air. Boost starting is a very familiar concept in a lot of racing games, and it's no different in Wipeout 2048. At the exact moment the countdown to start the race reaches go, hit the thrust button and you'll receive a speed boost off the line. On certain tracks you may notice that there are a number of alternate routes you can take away from the main route. These are called skill cuts, and they provide a means of gaining a fraction of a second on the opposition if you can reach them. However, they all have a little bit of a sting in their tail. They may have a tricky entrance, they may be incredibly narrow, they may be open on the side so you can fall off, or they may just be generally tricky to navigate. You need to be very confident in your racing skills to use skill cuts, as if you mess up, you'll actually end up losing more time than if you'd have just taken the normal route. There's a few skill cuts that require a turbo to reach, which may require you to know how to properly manage your pitch so that you can gain enough height. Higher difficulty AI will have no problem with taking skill cuts themselves, so you'll need to be aware of where they are and how to use them if you want to compete.
Pilot Assist is an additional mechanic designed for those players who are very new to the game and want a little bit of extra assistance with staying off the walls. Imagine it to be like a set of training wheels on a bike. If the craft approaches a side wall, an autopilot will very briefly kick in and will guide the craft away. Here's a demonstration of how it works. What you're about to see is a lap of Rockway Stadium using the Piranha Speed. I will not use the air brakes or side shift at all during this run. The pilot assist actually did a very good job of keeping me off the walls, so it seems that this function would be very useful to beginners who struggle in heavier craft or at the higher speed classes. However, while it is much improved from the version seen in Wipeout HD Fury, I will repeat the advice I gave from my previous guide. Oh come on, you really expect me to do the same joke twice? You know my opinion already. I would strongly advise any beginners watching this video to resist the temptation to use Pilot Assist. While it does seem like a good tool for getting started, it encourages some very bad habits that can be incredibly difficult to break. Firstly, remember what I said earlier about Racing Line. Sometimes you want to be very close to a wall in order to tackle a track section in the most efficient way. However, the Pilot Assist can't tell if you're near to a wall intentionally and will push you away regardless. Have a look at these three corners on Rockway Stadium at the start of the lap. On the left, I have Pilot Assist disabled, and on the right, it is enabled. The ideal racing line through here is to brush each apex as close as possible, but watch what the Pilot Assist does as I try to do this. By pushing the craft away from the apex, my racing line has been weakened and I'm now behind where I should be. It also pushed me away from two speed pads. While the difference is only marginal at the moment, this will build up over the course of a whole race. Even worse is that it can be somewhat unpredictable. There are cases where you may only need a small push just to nudge you away from the wall, but instead it will give you a violent jolt that can be difficult to regain control from. If the track section is narrow, this can lead to you pinballing from one wall to the other, which again is going to slow you down massively in the long run, and you might as well have just taken the wall impact. Even if you can take all of this, there's one final problem with relying on pilot assist. It actually slows you down. What you're seeing now is a lap of Unity Square with Pilot Assist active on the left. The lap without Pilot Assist is over a second faster, and it wasn't even a particularly good lap. If you're just starting out, it may be tempting to put Pilot Assist on to help you in the beginning, and for some, it may prove to be a good learning tool. But eventually, you're going to have to take the training wheels off, and it will take you far longer to get to grips with the game than if you just dived in at the start and learned without them. Take the time to practice in speed lap mode, and you'll be fine. The weapon systems have always been a staple of the Wipeout series, whether to disrupt your opponents or to outright destroy them. You can pick up weapons by flying over active weapon pads. In 2048 you'll notice there are two different colours of weapon pad this time. Green pads will equip your craft with a defensive weapon, while yellow pads will give you an offensive weapon. This allows a somewhat more strategic approach to weapons, as while which weapon you get will still be random, you at least have a little control over which type you want. We'll look at defensive weapons first. The shield is your classic defensive weapon. Activating it will erect a shield around your craft for 3 seconds, rendering you immune to all damage and disruption from impacts. 
Also, if you're hit by a weapon while you're holding a shield, it will automatically activate. The turbo will give you a significant speed boost when activated, allowing you to close the gap with your opponents, gain some height to barrel roll, or to reach a skill cut. Mines are your typical way of dealing with anyone breathing down your neck. Activating it will deploy a cluster of mines directly behind your craft. Hitting one won't do a great deal, but anyone ploughing through all of them won't be pleased. Mines can only be used by speed and agility class craft. Bombs are a somewhat more violent way of getting your opponents off your back. Activating it will drop a single bomb directly behind you, and the explosion will damage everyone within a short radius. Only fighter class craft can equip bombs. The autopilot will take control of your craft out of your hands for a brief time. Perfect for helping you around tricky sections of the course, and they're also incredibly useful in skill cuts. A shield will also be activated while the autopilot lasts. The Leech Beam is a homing weapon that drains your target's shield energy and uses it to recharge your own. When the targeting reticle turns green, activate it to latch the beam onto your opponent. It requires you to stay within range to remain active, and a shield will also activate for as long as it is. Now we move on to offensive weapons. The missile is a homing weapon that inflicts a small amount of damage to your opponent. When the reticle turns yellow, activating it will send the missile chasing after them. It's fairly agile and can also bounce off walls. If needed, it can also be fired blind. Rockets are unguided versions of missiles. On activating, the rockets will be fired in a spread pattern directly ahead of you. They're moderately damaging, but highly disruptive. How many rockets are fired depends on the variant of the craft that you're piloting. Speed class craft can only fire one rocket. Agility variants can fire two rockets and fighter craft can fire three. The cannon is an ammunition-based weapon. Holding the fire button will unleash a stream of bullets straight ahead of you. While they deal very little damage, sustained fire can be highly disruptive. The cannon comes with 30 rounds that can be fired intermittently. You can also absorb any remaining ammunition to restore a small amount of shield energy. The Plasma Bolt is the most powerful single-shot weapon in the game. When activated, the bolt takes a second to charge before it's sent hurtling down the track ahead of you. Its charge time makes it very difficult to aim, but anything hit by it will suffer very heavy damage. The Quake is your get out of jail free card if you find yourself further back in the field. Activating it will send a huge energy wave straight down the track ahead of you. There is absolutely no way to avoid this weapon. The only way to weather it if you're in range is to activate a shield. Speed class craft cannot equip this weapon. The minigun is unique to the Kyrex prototype. It's the only weapon it can equip, and frankly, it's the only one it needs. The minigun can hold up to 30 ammunition, which is generated 10 at a time every few seconds, and it's fired in the same way as the cannon. The rounds are devastating, and a full clip can easily destroy another craft. Your shield energy tells you how much damage your craft is able to sustain before it's destroyed. It's depleted by wall impacts, leaving the track, attempting a barrel roll, or impacts from your opponent's weapons. Any damage sustained will be mitigated depending on the health stat of the craft you're piloting. However, this will not affect energy loss from barrel rolls. That's a standard 15% regardless. If your shield energy drops to 0%, your craft will be destroyed. In a single player race event, this will end the race. However, when playing online, you will respawn. To prevent this from happening, you can absorb any weapons you pick up by hitting the circle button. Different weapons will restore different amounts of energy, although the general rule is the more powerful the weapon, the more energy it will restore. There are four separate speed classes in Wipeout 2048. 
The first one you will encounter is C-Class, and is the equivalent of Flash Class in Wipeout HD. This is the slowest class available, and is ideal for you to learn the layout of new tracks. Stick with a high handling agility class craft, and you should be able to deal with the majority of circuits without any use of air brakes. B class is the equivalent of Rapier class in HD. Somewhat faster than the previous class, you'll now need to make use of air brakes regularly, even in craft that have a high handling stat. A class is the equivalent of Phantom class in HD. This was previously as fast as it got, and it's only because of the wider tracks that things are slightly easier than they were. You'll need to know the tracks well to compete here, and even agility class craft will need to make good use of air brakes to navigate properly. A plus class is a different world entirely. Faster than even Phantom class used to be, you'll need to know every corner of every track inside out, and you'll need to have absolutely mastered the air brakes and side shifting. One wrong move and you'll find yourself slamming into walls all over the place. This is definitely one for the experts only. And just to give you an idea of the differences between them, here's a direct comparison of all four classes. There are a range of game modes you can amuse yourself with in Wipeout 2048, depending on whether you just want to race, blow stuff up, or a bit of both. All of these game modes feature in the 2048 campaign, which I'll talk about next. Settings for these game modes can be altered in the race box menu. Single race and tournament modes put you up against seven opponents over a number of laps depending on which speed class you have chosen. You can choose whether to have weapons activated or not. If you're setting up an online race, you can also choose to activate Pure Racing Mode, which allows infinite shield energy, a turbo per lap, and allows all craft to clip through each other. In Tournament Mode, you score points depending on your position at the end of each race. Whoever has accumulated the most points at the end wins. Combat puts the emphasis on shooting each other. The object here is to score points by inflicting damage on opponents, and to be the first to reach a points target. Points are awarded depending on the amount of damage inflicted, and also whether a craft is destroyed. You can combat spin in this event too, allowing you to spin through 180 degrees and fire on opponents coming up behind you. Combat is slightly different in the campaign, you'll be given a time limit to reach a points target instead. Time trial and speed lap modes remove all opponents from the track and leave you to set the best lap and race times that you can. Time Trial focuses on setting a total race time over a number of laps determined by Speed Class, and Speed Lap focuses on setting the fastest individual lap time you can. Speed Lap mode is endless, until you end the session yourself, so it's perfect for learning a new track with no pressure. Zone Mode introduces you to the fastest speeds that Wipeout 2048 has to offer, and it's perfect for acclimatising yourself to the faster speed classes. Your craft will auto-accelerate and there is no way to slow down. The object is simply to survive as long as you can. Over time, your craft will gradually get faster, reaching speeds well in excess of anything you'll see in normal gameplay. The game ends when your craft is destroyed. The last thing to talk about is the 2048 campaign as this is where you're going to be unlocking all of your content. When you first start the game, you'll notice the only craft you have access to is the Fizar Speed. Not a bad thing, as it's actually a very good craft for beginners. But how do you unlock all the others? The good news is you can find out exactly how by hovering your cursor over each one. You'll notice that there's two ways to unlock things, either by accumulating experience or by completing challenges. Both of these are done in the campaign. When you first open the campaign, only the 2048 season will be open to you, and when you enter, only a single cell is accessible. Over on the right you can see the conditions needed to complete the cell. They will all have pass conditions, which are usually fairly straightforward to meet, 
and elite pass conditions which tend to be much harder. You can see shadows of other cells around the one you can select. When you complete a cell, this will unlock all adjacent cells. Only a pass is needed to move on. However, gaining a pass or an elite pass will award XP which goes towards increasing your rank. Unsurprisingly, elite passes award more XP. So if you want to raise your rank faster, then this will be what you should be aiming for. You'll also notice that you receive small amounts of XP during races in the campaign for performing different actions, such as hitting speed pads or inflicting damage on opponents. This will be added to your total at the end of the race. As you go through the campaign, you'll notice that you can branch off from the main section. The advantage to this is that you'll find challenge cells at the ends that can lead to you unlocking new craft. The challenge will usually involve you using the new craft in one way or another. You should be able to reach rank 50 without Elite passing every single cell, but there's a gold trophy available should you manage to do this. This is primarily because of the a challenge cells. These involve you racing against the Elite AI over a 10 lap endurance race on a class. While I've joked in the past about the Elite AI on Wipeout HD Fury, in 2048 they are absolutely brutal, and you'll need to have mastered how to handle your craft to stand a chance against them. I should add here that if you're playing the original Vita version, you will gain far less XP and you'll need to go to the online campaign to continue raising your rank. So while this has been a very long video and there's been a fair amount to pick up on, the final piece of advice I can give to you is to stick with it and practice. Speedlap is your friend when it comes to trying out techniques and learning new tracks, and use zone mode to help acclimatize yourself to the higher speed classes. Give it enough time and enough attempts, and you'll crack it sooner than you think. Thank you all very much for watching, hope to see you all online.